no need to move, just, uh, just don't leave, don't leave. <laughs> um, I've, okay, so I'm Phil, <clears throat> sorry, I'm Phil Dillard. I'm here from San Francisco. I'm starting my timer because I know that I'm the last man between everybody and uh, craft beer and food. So um, I want to first thank everybody for sticking around. I also want to make sure that this talk is, a, is, a, is a, a prize for you. It's a gift for you because you get a little something extra out of it um, uh, for sticking around a little bit. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about myself, what we're going to talk about, and uh, just some ground rules. Please feel free at any time to, to raise your hand and ask a little bit of a question. There's been a lot of talk today about the strategy and summary and, and opportunities, and there's been a broad ranging discussion. But, and I, and I started a little um, idea, a word map of all the different things that I heard that we're talking about today. But what I wanna get into today, since I get to be the last person to go, is something that helps you synthesize some of the, some of the lessons that you've gotten today. Think about what we're talking about. Think about the lean startup in terms of how the lean startup can help you tactically execute on some of the ideas that you've heard, okay? And the reason I want to do that is because it's good. Oh, okay. Here's how we're going to go through it. I'm going to talk through what the Lean Startup is about, what we're trying to accomplish, a little bit of history, a little bit of approach, and a little bit of usefulness, how to use, what to do next. And then some, some ideas and subjections that I've heard based on the comments from today. I'm trying not to repeat anything you've heard about the Lean Startup already, anything from any of the other uh, folks before, but to use some of the content that those people talked about to ground the approach in the people who are going through it. I also like to talk about Airbnb. How many people in here know who Airbnb is? All right, good, everybody's still active. Well, that's 100% that's all the time. I wanna talk about Airbnb because though they didn't start as a lean company and though they struggled a lot, they're a good example for us to talk about and we are working with them to capture the part of their story of when they started using the lean startup and the differences that they, that they went through. It's easy to describe some of the use case of the lean startup approach talking about Airbnb because everybody knows it and everybody has had an experience with this company. Are there any entrepreneurs left, startups and left in the audience? Can you raise your hand? All right, good, okay. So um, the other thing I wanted to add in here, please ask some questions, but at the end of this, uh, for the first two or three, three people who come by, I, wanna, I want the entrepreneurs to particularly interact with this. For the first three people who come by, I'm willing to offer uh, two hours of, of free virtual coaching over a course of a two month period on this stuff if you're willing to work with it. Especially if you're thinking about coming to San Francisco for the Lean Startup Conference. And I didn't tell Dave I was gonna do this, but we thought it might be a really interesting uh, idea to engage with folks and to, to help you work through some of the process of getting this going. Okay, so let's talk about Lean Startup. Dispel one thing first. It's not about not spending money. It's not about being cheap. It's not about cheap minimum viable products, right? But it's being about effective with the money that we've got and doing things that are big. I pulled this from Eric early on. Um, I, I think the lead startup has, has been kicked around a lot. i sorry, has been not kicked around. <laughs> has been introduced a lot today, um, but I don't know how much we've gotten into tactics of what it's about. And what I hope that we can do is help people connect the dots between some of the jargon and some of the terms and actually um, have a means to use that with uh, <clears throat> have the means to use it with where you are, um, where, what, you were, what you heard today and what you're trying to do in your business. So some of the key questions we hear, what is it, what is it why and how does it work? How do you get started? Um, we're gonna cover a lot of that today. And one of the things I also talk, we talked about a lot today was innovation. The term innovation means to us, innovation meaning ideation plus execution. Ideation meaning that there is, you're creating a bunch of ideas, there's some implicit knowledge in you as an entrepreneur that you've got the ability to create these ideas. And then execution meaning you actually have the ability to execute on it. And the lean startup process is a, is a, is a procedure, it's an approach for actually being able to implement better um, execution. The reason I put these different organization types up here is because over the course of the past year, I've done consulting or coaching or training with all those types of groups. We found it to work in all sorts of industries and in companies of all sizes because of the simple, because of some of the things I'm gonna break down around when we get into the why it works and the how it works. But anywhere you have an area of high uncertainty, okay, where you don't know the future, where you can't predict the future, lean startup process applies, it's helpful. If you're starting a new business, you don't know the market, 
You don't know how many you're going to sell this year or next year. Now you're going to give your investor a business plan that's going to tell a story of one possible future, but you're not necessarily going to be able to predict it. And this helps us work through the uncertainty. So where did it come from? It didn't just pop up out of the blue. It didn't just start with Eric. If you think about management philosophies, and this is a management, 21st century management philosophy, there are, there are some over the past 100 years that show up on the board. Um, lean, lean, lean startup, as Eric describes it, comes analogous to lean manufacturing, which after you did industrialization and you started building production lines and started getting more efficient, efficient in manufacturing, in the 50s and 60s, the uh, developed statistical process controls and lean manufacturing, efficient ways of reducing cycle time, eliminating waste, and making manufacturing more effective. Analogous to that is the, is the origin of the lean startup, but it's not just based in the lean manufacturing. It actually takes uh, the steps of the scientific process and puts that into validated learning, it takes some of the mentality of customer development and customer engaged discussion to actually generate the, uh, the ideas themselves and actually gets you to the point where you're basing your results, as Brand explained earlier, on experience and actual activity of people, the actual behaviors of people as opposed to their opinions. So you can go from uncertainty to certainty. You can go from a hypothesis about the future, an idea of how people might behave, but actually test their behavior, measure their behavior, capture the data, learn from the data, and then revise your thinking so you're moving in the right direction with certainty as opposed to guessing and hoping that you're gonna be right. So let's talk about the approach. These are some of the key concepts, some of the words you might have heard. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through them in sequence. Normally, we would, this, this training itself can be a two-hour training, a three-hour training, a full-day training, working through just these concepts. But if you are, if just want to get to be able to apply them, we could either, we'll talk about them either in the experience of one of the entrepreneurs if they want to vol <clears throat> volunteer it up, or I'll use Airbnb as I talk about it. But we want to talk about first about in innovation, what entrepreneurs are, entrepreneurship, startups. We're going to work through this in sequence so that we get all of it. Because I already defined, in in <clears throat> I already defined innovation. It's this ideation plus execution. And there's an opportunity for enterprises and for startups in this. By this, we mean corporations are looking for innovation. Startups are looking for innovation, right? We heard a whole bunch of different ways that the corporates are looking for innovation these days. They're creating innovation offices and innovation labs. They're acquiring startup companies. All of these are different interesting models, right? So in an uncertain world, you definitely need a whole lot of innovation. Um, Brand, I think, alluded a little bit to the different types of innovation. If you're an entrepreneur, you don't necessarily need to be swinging for the fences to be creating the next Facebook, right? You can be doing sustaining innovation inside of an organization because those help an organization grow, keep new customers, and keep their products and services fresh. You can be doing something that, that's like a revolutionary, um, revolutionary innovation that is significant, but it's not shifting you so much away from your uh, formal business model, your existing business model. Or you could be moving into the area of disruptive innovation that we talk about a lot. That is, that is actually shifting and can be changing the under, underpinnings of a business model of an existing company. Different types of innovation. So what's entrepreneurship and what's an entre entrepreneur? Entrepreneurship is this management discipline of where we deal with uncertainty, right? Where you, you deal with specifically with situations of high uncertainty and, and you eliminate that uncertainty. A startup then becomes a company or an organization that applies this discipline, right? So you can conceptually then have a startup inside of an organization. You can have a startup that is a, a start company, startup company. Part of the reason why this works in a number of different organizations, because any organization that has uncertainty and that creates space for people to actually fix that uncertainty is the concept of a startup. Now the difference is there are going to be different restraints on different types of organizations. Corporations, can't, you can't allow people to run around willy-nilly doing whatever they want to do. You don't necessarily engage customers the same way you do in a corporation as you do as a startup. But the fundamental approach here is similar, and we just adjust the approach a little bit based on the type of the organization that we're dealing with. So I mentioned already the Lean Startup is a method to systematically, uh, systematically um, <clears throat> System, I need like a cup of water. Systematically um, address uncertainty through periods of rapid iteration and market learning. 
the rapid iteration is what we get from, from lean manufacturing. It is when you, when you make smaller tests and you make smaller bets and you iterate in the process. If you, if you go the old way that we talked about, that some folks have talked about in the first dot, dot, uh, dot com era, people would spend a year building a product or more and then walk out the door and hope it got sold. So you spend a year of your life and however much money hoping that it would work at the end of the day. In this process, we talk about smaller, iter smaller bets and smaller learning loops and making an estimate after a week or two of work or a month or two of work or a few hundred or a few thousand dollars instead of hundreds or thousands or millions of dollars because now you can make more bets and you can make more, you can learn more as you're trying to find that fit between your product and the market and you're not actually just waiting, you're not waiting so long to find validation from your customer. So, Lean Startup helps us answer two questions. Should we build a product or service? And if we do build that product or service, how do we increase the probability of success in the marketplace because of these, this iterative approach? And there are four fundamental, sorry, five fundamental principles that we'll talk about here. I actually alluded a little bit earlier to entrepreneurs are everywhere and entrepreneurship being, manage, being management. I want to touch on these concepts of validated learning, the build measure loop, and innovation accounting. Validated learning is a concept that just says, instead of asking someone their opinion, I'm going to test their behavior. And I'm going to test their behavior, then that's going to give me some more information because people don't always do what they say they're going to do. People say they're going to buy a product, they say they love a service, they say they love these different features, but they don't necessarily use them, and you've got to find a way to uncover it. So validated learning is a process of doing it. If you, look, if you look at the steps of validated learning, it looks just like creating an experiment in the scientific method. And the result of it is a sort of value test. One of the best tests for value with a product or service, probably you could always already guess, is money. Will people pay for it? So sometimes you could start with an idea for a product or service and create your first experiment where you're going to test and see if someone will pay for buying your service. Um, and I'll use the Airbnb example here. Um, does anybody know how Airbnb started? Anybody heard this before? Okay, how Airbnb started. So Brian Chesky was living in LA. He had $1,000 to his name. He decided that he hated his job, he hated his future. He wanted to move to San Francisco for a designer conference with a couple of his, his, his buddies. They moved to San Francisco. Thanks. They moved to San Francisco. He had, he had $1,000 in his pocket. He had, a room, he had money for rent, but he couldn't get into the conference. But all the hotel rooms were sold out. So they said, you know, I bet if we rented out some of the space, we could get some money for the next month of rent and to pay for the conference. So they put an ad on Craigslist or something, that, or I think it was on Craigslist, um, to rent out the room, and they said, we can give you an airbed, and we'll give you breakfast. And they sold the room for, they sold, three people um, responded to the ad, and they uh, rented out their room. And they found that they enjoyed having the people, the people enjoyed being in their, in their apartment and feeling what it's like to be part of the startup scene in San Francisco, but they made money out of the deal as well. And they were looking for, at the time for an idea, and this one just struck them that said, wow, this could be something interesting. At the time, they didn't think it was a billion dollar idea, but they just thought it would be something cool. But it spurred a vision around being somewhere in a different part of the world and feeling like you were home, feeling like you were part of the community, and also having a lower cost means of, stay, of travel and lodging. So the idea that spawned out of the necessity to pay the, to, to pay the run, rent in the month and to find a business led him to this business. But it took him over a year and a half of struggle before they started to get some traction and a lot of people who were telling them that they had a really, a really bad idea. Take a sip of water. <laughs> oh no, it's so much, so much excitement. I'm hollering in, in Ireland. Day two. So people telling them they had a really bad idea, but then they started actually applying practices that are, are now part of this, the lean startup process. Before I move on to that, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about innovation accounting. Innovation accounting is the means by which we measure the, 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 we measure the learning that you, you learn in a startup. If you're in an enterprise, you're looking for optimization rev, of revenue, optimization of profits, you're running gap accounting, but you don't have a means to measure. If you put $10 million into your investment portfolio, 
and nothing came out this year. You don't have a means to measure that in terms of what did you learn and what was the value of that. If you raise $5 million as a startup from a, a, uh, from a VC and you run out of that money in a year's time and you don't have product market fit, how do you go get more? How do you, how do you quantify the value of we learned a lot? And the integration between validated learning and innovation and accounting gives you the ability to actually put a, put a means to measure the actual value that, you, that you've learned from the, from the certainty that you gained instead of the uncertainty by the experiments that you run. So I normally, I'm going to check my time here. We normally talk about um, a classic case of failure in this to ground us in the reason of why we, we want to do this. How many people are familiar with a company called Webvan? One, two, three. Okay, Webvan is in the US a classic case of dot-com failure and why we do use the lean startup process. Webvan was founded in December 1996. They raised several hundreds of millions of dollars. They were valued at over a billion dollars, at, or sorry, over four billion dollars at one point. They had this idea that said, we're gonna deliver groceries to your door. And if within 30 minutes of an order, you'll get all your groceries anywhere in the US. They hired one of the most, one of the smartest management consultants in the company, in the country. They hired a national sales force. They created state-of-the-art distribution centers that rival what you've got at Amazon today. They built, they bought tons of uh, vans um, and painted them with Webvan. They had a national ad campaign and everything, but they forgot to ask one important question. Anybody guess what that question might be? Do you want it? Exactly. And the resounding answer was no. People did not want other people to deliver their groceries. Some people because of the selection, some people because of freshness, some people because they weren't really comfortable. A lot of people because they didn't want to transact online. And the transaction online idea comes to me because we can make it, we can, we're, I'm guessing on this because I haven't sat down with the executives there to see if they actually, which of those was the most important, but clearly I'm making an assumption that's one of the top reasons that people couldn't do it because there was no effective way to transact online. Two years later, an unknown company called PayPal came along and solved that problem and became way larger than this company, right? They became way larger because everybody who was trying to transact online was trying to figure out a safe and effective way to do it, and we're looking for a trusted market leader to do it. And I think a lot of people know some of the guys, who, men and women who were involved in PayPal and where they've gone since then. So this was a colossal failure. That's the peak of their markets. And in 1999, they were out of cash before 2001 and wasted all that value. So we tell the story of Webvan to say, if you have to ask some very simple questions, if they had asked some very simple questions early on, they could have not only dominated that industry when it was ready, but found a new one that was right there under their nose for them to expose. And this is the, 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 the case that we want to avoid as entrepreneurs because a lot of times you could find these things very quickly, very quickly, even when you're not looking for them, but just by addressing some of your key assumptions. Now, I hate the, I hate the fact that I use some of these words to describe um, before defining them, but I'm gonna bring this all together. So I'm going to go back to Airbnb. We started talking with, about Airbnb, and I talked about the vision that they developed after they rented the first room, a vision of the future, where you could go anywhere, and you could stay with someone and live in someone's home and feel like you were part of the community. Visions will often drive companies, but sometimes visions derive from problems. So whether you're solving a problem or you have this great vision of the future, this is the place where you start. Once you have your vision, you want to try and make that come true. And we're going to walk through, you, we walk you through the build, measure, learn loop of how to do this, but I'm going to come back to that. Once you have your, your vision, you're going to make some um, assumptions about what you know and what you don't know. And uh, this gives you a, a feeling of like understanding your uncertainty. On the board here, I put up three different types of uncertainty. There's technical, there's customer, and there's business model uncertainty. I'll skip the quiz this time because I've already given away the answer by bolding the one in the middle. Webvan didn't fail because they weren't able to deliver the groceries. They didn't fail because they weren't able to provision the orders. They failed because they didn't resolve the uncertainty, the uncertainty in the market by asking the question, if I build this, will people buy it? The more you ask that question, the earlier you ask that question, the more you get details around who in the market wants it, why they want it, how they would use it, the more you can understand. You could be completely wrong in your assumptions 
about the market and learn enough to deliver a new product or service in which you're completely right because you know for certain what they want and what they need versus what you assumed. And thus your intuition and your vision and your drive as an entrepreneur is then validated and drawn forward because you walked into a process that helped you div divide certainty out of uncertainty and empower you forward as an entrepreneur. Does that make sense? Okay. So, a lot of times we talk in the Lean Startup and people say, well, it might work for a software or it might work for a new company like Airbnb or Consumer Internet, but how's it going to work for me? So I pull up this slide because General Electric, who is the leader in lean manufacturing, who pushed it around the world and taught people how to be black belts in, in lean manufacturing, of course, after, Toyota, after the Toyota production system, these guys saw the lean startup and said, the CEO said, we're going to learn this and we're going to do it. And I put up here an example of some of their projects that they've worked on. They now have a global center of excellence run by four people. They have hundreds of lean startup coaches ongoing and hundreds of uh, coaches in the company, and they have tons of projects. And these projects range from diesel engines and flow meters to new big medical devices to anything you could imagine under the sun, but it's real physical stuff, just like the stuff that Mark talked about with his Eco ATM. This is being done by companies large and small, seeing a whole lot of value out of the process. So I talked about an assumption. What's an assumption? An assumption is just your statement of what you believe, the, the way something works. It's a statement of belief, and I believe that statement that clarifies uncertainty, what you know. I think people are gonna buy this. I think Airbnb, I think people are going to love what we have to offer, right? In this example, I write one, uh, what, uh, what um, I would describe as their initial assumption. Thanks. In a, um, in a city where space is extremely limited, people are willing to pay for a room, pay a small amount of space. They don't need to be in a hotel or a motel, they'll stay in someone's home. A big assumption at the time, right? How many people, when they first heard of Airbnb, thought it was crazy that you could rent out a room in your home to a complete stranger? Anybody? I did. I thought it was nuts, right? So. When I, when I, when I, if I'm an entrepreneur and I'm trying to get clear on my assumptions, I list out all the assumptions that I have. If I don't know it for a fact, 100% for, for a fact, then you list them out as assumptions. When I do this work with my projects teams, because I coach on it and consult on it, but I also run projects on my own with some, with some startup companies, so when we work on this, we work on everything. We break our assumptions out into things around the problem, things around the solution, things around how to implement the solution, and then we list them out. But you don't know where to start. When you're starting this out as an entrepreneur, you probably know this, it's really hard to figure out, I got a million things going on, where do I start, right? So here's a simple one. You take a list of assumptions, whether it's 10, 20, 50, 100, and you say, if this assumption is wrong, does it kill my business or does it not kill it? Those things that are kill go above the kill line. Those that don't go below the kill line, right? And now you've separated out those 100 into the top few. And then you look at them and you say, which one's really important? And you can sequence that four instead of 100. Or you can go on the other side and you could say, well, I'm gonna think about impact versus time horizon. Which one have the most impact in the shortest time horizon? And map them out that way on the X, Y axis. And then you see a nice little pattern. You start to group the things that mean the same things. You start to have conversations amongst your team. Everybody in the assumptions building exercise in your team is writing down their assumptions on one little piece of post-it paper. And you realize that people have different terms for the same thing. Somebody might, might write about a customer, somebody might write about a client. Your team who's sitting around the table has the ability to get to the same definitions of different things. And it's a team building exercise. It's a culture building exercise. It's a learning exercise for your team. So you know that your team is talking about the same things when you're working on problems, okay? This is allows you to get to the most important things that you as a team agree upon that you need to solve in a very simple prioritization matrix of your assumptions so that everybody has a common belief about what's important and how they think that the market is going to react to what you're going to do. It solves that problem that we were talking about. Somebody, one of the speakers was talking about, about the engineers not knowing what's going on with the marketers and that sort of thing. We teach this for startups, but as well as big corporates because everybody gets to this problem at some point. So then we identify those critical assumptions or leaf of faith assumptions. Those are in the will kill 
assumption category, and we make sure that we start to work on them. So I don't just jump into them. I want to prioritize them and resolve the most important ones first. So then we start to create a hypothesis so we can build an experiment. A hypothesis is a lot like assumption. It's like taking that assumption but building a wrapper around that. It's an if-then statement that gives you more clarity around your assumption and specifically allows you to create an, an experiment. The specificity in the action, timing, and value of impact is the most important thing in the, in the hypothesis. Okay? So I'm going to take that list of 100 assumptions. I'm going to cut them down to those for kill, don't kill. It gets me made down four to five. Then I'm going to create a hypothesis around the first one that I'm going to test. And this gives me a basis for building an experiment. So here's a hypothesis that's based on that Airbnb example I talked about. If we believe that if we take, so I'll give you a backstory. So they had a number of listings in New York City, but they weren't meeting their expectations of sales. They expected 40% penetration, something of that nature, but they were significantly below, and they were scratching their head trying to figure out why. It wasn't working with the copy, it wasn't working with advertising. So they came up with a hypothesis. They said, we believe that if you take professional pictures of the places, because the pictures stink now, that there's gonna be an increase. But you have to commit to how much that's going to be. It's what Brandt talked about when he said you have to put a stake in the ground. You have to say how much, over what period of time, what's going to move the needle on what these different people do. So he said, if you take professional photos for listings in New York City, you'll get two to three times more business within the first 60 days of those things posting up. So you separate out what you do. You go into a neighborhood in your system, you get 100 houses that are 100 places where you can take pictures, 100 pictures where you don't. You watch those, 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 the differences between those two groups over the next 60 day period and you see the results. What they found was there was a 10x improvement instead of a two to three x improvement. So it was significantly better than what they expected. They started to learn from that experiment and adjusted their business accordingly. That's how you turn an assumption into a hypothesis that you actually do an experiment that gives you data that you can that you can work with. And I put up here the difference, the, the one above the other, so you can see the difference between the two. Okay, so I talk about an experiment. It's a scientific uh, test that you perform to get an understanding of, um, to get a, get an understanding that gives you data. When you when you repeat experiments over and over again, that's experimentation. The more quickly you can do the experimentation, the more rapid you you can learn. You can start early with smaller and smaller experiments. We often say, if you're, tr if you're trying to do something and you can't figure out how you can do it, and you say it's so hard, and you're trying with too big of an experiment, break it down into a smaller and smaller increment. So then we get to the concept of MVP. It's a minimal viable product. The minimum viable product is an experiment vehicle. It's a means for you to do an experiment. The MVP story that we talked about at Airbnb could have been done walking down the street with a, with a picture that you could have a simpler one because you didn't even have a product yet. An MVP allows you to do something before you have your full product. Um, in EQA ATM, it was the first, that first ATM that didn't have all the full features and it wasn't fully working, was supported by human beings. And there's much of different ways you can do it. But the important thing I want to take away from here is, just like you saw in the notes about, um, about General Electric, it's not a one-time event. You're going to have multiple MVPs on the path to one version of your product. But in a real lean company, in a real lean startup, you're gonna be continually developing and improving your product because you're continuously talking to customers. And you're continuously talking to customers because in the environment that we're in today, there's always somebody behind you nipping at your heels trying to disrupt you. It could be a big company, it could be another startup. There's a bunch of different folks that are out there, but we believe that you have to continue this approach because it's the way that you get ahead and you stay ahead and you can keep control of your company and keep control of your destiny and your future, okay? So that's a, a high level of the build, measure, learn loop. You take your ideas and your vision, you build something, may or may not need code, you measure, because you can do it with a, with a handwritten MVP, you can do it with a one pager on a landing page, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. You measure the results, you take the data, you analyze the data, you learn, you refine your knowledge, your, your thinking of the world, and you iterate in the loop. Some loops are small loops and fast loops. Some loops are bigger and slower loops. Some experiments might take a day, some might take a week. While I'm here, my team this weekend is doing an experiment that's gonna take half a day. 
but it's a key experiment to see if this project that we're working on is gonna, gonna move forward. It's okay for them to be different times. You should expect them to take different amount of time, but if you're applying the process, know that you're gonna do more and more tests. And then you have something to say when you go to the investors. It's one thing to say, we think there's a lot of promise in this market. It's another thing to say, we tested it with a thousand people. We expected a hundred of them to like it, 500 of them ordered it. There is a significant amount more of, of a bigger market than we thought. If the other tests, if the other tests pan out this way, this is how we're gonna use the money that we're asking for. That's, that's a better way to tell a story to an investor. So, you wanna make sure when, that you're making these experiments so you know what you're, you're gonna get, I mean, you know what you're gonna do with the information that you're gonna get, and you wanna be able to use the process. This is straight, this is the validated learning process, just what we talked through. Create your assumptions, build a hypothesis, build an experiment, measure the results. It's exactly the five steps of the scientific method. And we wanna to get to these things that are on the top that are called actionable metrics, not vanity metrics. Vanity metrics are clicks or impressions or articles in a newspaper. Actionable metrics are, I put it out there, I expected to 100 people, I expected 25 to like it and 50 liked it. I asked people for their information, 80% of their people gave me their information. I offered it at $10, $10 I offered it at $15, I offered it at $20, and people were buying it, but they stopped buying at 2250. Metrics that give me information for how to drive the business, those are actionable metrics. They are positively correlated with our learning milestones, with the learning milestones that are gonna help us move the business forward. Okay, last component up here is this pivot or persevere decision. People have heard about it. Pivot is a change in strategy without a change in vision. Meaning, my vision is still the same to build Airbnb. My vision is still the same to change the way people travel and interact. But the strategy to get there might change because a couple of the ideas that I've tried might have failed. If I go through all of my, if I go through my significant, important hypotheses on one idea, then I can want to, then I want to pivot, and then I want to change. I don't want to change willy-nilly. I don't want to change because someone gave me feedback at a, the conference. I don't want to change because I woke up this morning and I think I've got a great new inspiration. Right? Because we know that entrepreneurship doesn't work that way, we pivot based on our data. And there's a bunch of different types of pivots that Eric references in the book that tell you tactically how you can do pivots in a bunch of different ways. Okay. I talked a little, pardon? You need the last slide. This one? This one. Okay. Anybody who sends me an email, I'll, I'll, send, you, I'll send you the deck. I was trying to figure out what's going on. Okay, so we talk about how the Lean Startup works. It's scientific method, it's customer development, it's getting out of the building and talking to people. It's building a culture of testing and learning and improvement. Some basic lessons in the last few slides I wanna talk about. Um, you don't wanna spend your time and money building the wrong thing. Your time is valuable, your money is valuable. The, f the faster you get to a no or to a yes, the better off you are, the better you sleep at night as an entrepreneur. It's never an easy journey, but you wanna get, back, you wanna get to that. You want to kill the myth of the mythical entrepreneur. People don't know that Airbnb started on $1,000 and those guys ran up their credit cards and they didn't do anything for a year and a half with everybody telling them we're crazy. Everybody hears the story about it afterwards. And that's one of the few that succeeded. Lots of people, um, even um, our, our friend from EcoATM, talked about how there were multiple failures on the road to success, before and after. Talked about, Brent talked about start small to get, get big. Understand that, the, that Lean Startup is not the same thing as Scrum, not the same thing as uh, design thinking. These things are complementary, but they're different. Um, constant learning, constant development, and organizational honesty lead to culture change. If you're inside of an organization, you have to be clear with yourself about the fact of what you know and what you don't know, what's an assumption and what's not. If you're a startup, you have to do that the same way. Some things that I came up with listening to conversations about here, because this sounds like a special place and a special opportunity and a special time. You have a lot of the, of the key resources that you need. I was talking to one of the early venture capitalists in the Silicon Valley and he talked about why Silicon Valley became what it was. And if you think about it all the way back when the computers were coming up, Stanford University, they called it the Silicon Valley because there was nothing out in the valley. There was Stanford, there was a lot of ag land. That was it, okay? As the technology started to come out and started to surround the university, 
the community that grew up around the university were the people who worked from the, from the university, who were into technology, who came to this new and thriving area. The, the, the investors lived on the same street as the, as the people who were, who were building, the, um, building these companies, right? So there was a community, much like you have here, where people were pulling together with a common vision and a common mission of trying to get some things done. So you could see that there are similar structural things going on. So environment's what you made it, make them. Leadership can drive the culture change that you want. You seem to have a lot of that in the room. You have to make sure that you share validated learning, share success and failure, share things that worked, share things that didn't. Ask other people inside of your community what they think and, and make it sure that you walk the walk of saying failure is okay, that you embrace that failure, right? Because we can't only have success theater. Um, your global trends are opportunities today. Someone said something about it's easier to sail to Spain than was easier to sail to Spain than to fly, in, in, fly to England. That's an indication of something, right? That's an indication of something that you can't forget, that you can immediately walk outside of your door and be global in building your teams, in finding your funding, in finding your markets. Take advantage of that, that natural opportunity that you have. I see the Lean Startup as an opportunity to test MVPs, to, trust, to, to, um, to accelerate traction. Um, and that you can think about interesting ways of deploying seed capital because seed capital is probably the most important thing for early stage companies. You want enough to do something with, but you don't want to. You don't want to waste it. You don't want to waste the goodwill of your investors. You don't want to waste the limited resources that you've got. You've got a lot of great resources, but they're all limited, and you need to make sure that you do the most with them. So I would try and be really, really smart with the seed capital. So in terms of what to do next with the lean startup. Well, I just want to remember, how do you win? Recognize assumptions, test things early and often, understand what you know and what you don't know. Don't invalidate your own, the results of your own experiment. Just because the experiment was good when I ran the first experiment, for example, if I go back to Airbnb and I talk about doing 100 apartments, I'm not going to change my whole business based on 100. I might do another two cities then. Then I might do another four or five cities then. And then I, if, they, if, if I still have positive signals that that's the right way to go, then I can shift the rest of my business. Corporations can start with that too in a small way with little pockets of their customers. Or they can separate it outside of the organization so it doesn't relate to the brand, right? These are different ways that you can do these. You can, you can start using this um, and you don't actually put yourself at, at risk of having a, a confirmation bias, of actually having too much, having the right information lead you down the wrong path. You need to know why you're actually succeeding. On the flip side, don't go off and tell yourself you know things you don't know. We've been in this business for 10 years, I've heard that before, of why you're struggling. We know what to do. This is a great idea. Well, how can you measure it? Why did it fail before? Make sure you know that. Ask questions, limit uncertainty. There are a bunch of resources that we can offer through the Lean Startup Company. There's webcasts, there's podcasts, there's blogs, there's a bunch of information. I'm very willing to help and answer questions and came here to help Mr. Cunningham do something great. So um, please ask, ask me uh, questions afterwards. The startups I mentioned, excuse, come see me and um, I'd be happy to share some, share some knowledge and some coaching with you at no charge. Last but not least, let's not forget what the path to success looks like if it exits up and to the right, because a lot of time it doesn't exit up and to the right. This is extremely time, timeline uh, dependent, right? time horizon dependent, but it's a squiggly tough road to success. The more success you have, the more challenges you have, and it's really never over as that journey of an entrepreneur, but don't kid yourself that there's somebody out there, Elon Musk did, just, Elon Musk did not just have a simple walk to everybody on the planet knowing his name. It's a really challenging thing. With that, I'm all finished. I'm Phil Dillard. I'm here through Sunday. Thanks so much for your attention.